A very warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park on Other Therana 24. And tonight on the show, I thought of talking about something different, something new, a new concept that has been introduced here in Sri Lanka, linking the military and the corporates. Uh, this is uh, obviously called Military to Corporate. And the program is um, spearheaded. It's a concept of uh, the 20th Army Commander of uh, Sri Lanka, former Army Commander, General Daya Ratnayaka, who's joining me here in our studios at Hyde Park. A very warm welcome. Thank you for calling us. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, General Daya. And uh, I also have the co-author of the M2C program, uh, the framework here in Sri Lanka, Mr. Ranjiva Kulatunga. Thank you very much for being here. It's my pleasure. Thank you for inviting. So, um, General Daya Ratnayaka, I think without much introduction, uh, this is something new, as I said, a new concept, a concept that you have developed, that you have introduced. Military to cooperate, as our background says. What is this all about? What are we trying to do with the military? Isn't there too much of military presence already? Uh, I think it's not adequate <coughs> <coughs> at this moment because we have so much issues in the country mm -hmm. and so much uh, lack of discipline in the field and so on. So. Uh, the best fit will be the military officers. Here it is. <coughs> um, we have large number of uh, military officers retired and about to retire mm -hmm. in the country. Because of the problem that we had, the army became a little bigger, uh, out of proportion somewhat uh, to a country like ours. But we have a large military. <coughs> and uh, to tell you, uh, in Devery, frankly, uh, from 2016 to 2020, there were 40,000 soldiers to retire within four years in, in army alone then uh, there was a large number of officers to be reti uh, retired so they are now retired <coughs> so i looked at when i retire um, at the age of 55 so i got a lot of opportunities outside sri lanka and within sri lanka so <coughs> but um, i realize that not everybody gets this opportunity uh, so <coughs> uh, there is a there was a uh, vacuum kind of a thing mm -hmm and about the perceptions in the mili uh, outside military and the corporate world and the military officers, their own perceptions and all that. This was not fitting in, I realize. And th those who get into the uh, <coughs> corporate have been doing exceptionally well. Uh, so uh, some officers, but majority of the officers did not have uh, a proper uh, place to join after that because mm -hmm. they, in relation to the people who are working and their prime time they're leaving, at the age of 55, with so, so much discipline, so much professionalism, so much uh, uh, <coughs> capacity, capability, and all that. So <coughs> here on the other side, in the corporate world, there are a lot of uh, vacuums we understand. The, in the country, you see uh, the discipline, the volatility, complexity, uncertainty, ambiguities, all these things. Um, so military officers have been trained and equipped and structured to fit into such environments. Mm -hmm. So they become quite normal in such time. When other people become abnormal, these people are basically normal. That's how the military has been trained and equipped. So <coughs> I thought, so when I, the, my own experience, if I may say, take a minute and explain you. Uh, <coughs> when I got the opportunity, I was <coughs> invited by many companies. And uh, I joined um, an international company. And I realized I was doing very well. And they accepted me. And they uh <coughs> got the, uh, so much from me. And I also was enjoying and earn uh, money also in that sense. So, uh, so I thought, why not other officers? I have not gone through any special training to fit into such a bigger corporate company. You uh, had no such training to make the transition from military yeah, to corporate culture. I did not have culture. that. I did not have. Mm -hmm. But um, <coughs> I realized when I studied little bit, I realized there's uh, this mismatch here. So I thought we must introduce a program for military officers uh, retired and about to retire groups to <coughs> get into the private sector. So that is why I have been talking to people. Mr. Uh, Dr. Uday Indraratna, you know him. And I have been having longer chats with him. Then he, through him, I came to know Ranjiv. Mm -hmm. Then we had um, longer uh, chats. We realized that he developed a program. And we got together and developed a nice program. And uh, spoke to the, His Excellency and got the blessings of him. And he was very happy. And um, then I spoke to the <coughs> military chiefs. Uh, and they were also very happy. Uh, I spoke to some cross-section of officers. And they were also very happy. Mm -hmm. and so I thought, 
put this into practice. And so is this running an, as a government program? Or? No, 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 actually totally private. Mm -hmm. I uh, mentioned it to since we are going to get some officers who are about to retire, mm -hmm. we need to get the approval of uh, right. the Minister of Defence and Excel Excellency and the uh, commanders uh, of the armed forces. So I spoke to them and they <coughs> readily approved it and we implemented. We, um, we need to have sponsors. Um, so all that we found later on we can discuss mm -hmm. and um, so we put um, <coughs> into practice a super program. Uh, first program we completed and the success is enormous. So we'll talk about it. Certainly, later. I'd like yeah. to speak more on that. Uh, moving on to talk to Mr. Ranjiva Kulotunga, the co-author of this program, M2C, Military to Corporate. Of course, a recognized um, HR professional globally. Uh, you join hands with General Dayaratnayaka here in Sri Lanka to uh, make sure that this program is brought to ground, it is implemented and they, that, that um, the military or retired or retiring military professionals are trained. Uh, what makes you think that military professionals, as uh, General Dayaratnayaka said, that their capacity and capability uh, will be sufficient or could be uh, used in the corporate culture of Sri Lanka? Uh, because we're talking about uh, the training that that is given to military uh, personnel are, uh, is such that they will arise in situations of turmoil uh, or when the normal system breaks down. But uh, we are not anticipating that in corporates. But how do you think that they will have the competency uh, together with the capacity and the capability uh, to make that transition and help the corporates in Sri Lanka? Um, yeah, very valid question. Uh, see. Uh, how we started this whole thing before we even launched or crafted or customized the modules for the batch that just graduated on the 5th of April. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually facilitate a um, development center. Right. Okay, so what we did was we have uh, most of the HR colleagues in corporates. We identify from them as to what kind of capability competency do they see in the existing uh, ex-military officers who are now working. Mm -hmm. And uh, we also uh, looked at the uh, corporates in the current uh, situation with post-COVID, which is like a surprise and people are up and they should be really uh, change capable anyhow. Mm -hmm. So uh, how do we deal with that? And we also wanted to um, check where are the competencies that are lacking mm -hmm. and where the competencies should be competencies that they really should aspire in a corporate. Uh, that capsule we take and we designed this development center, mm -hmm. which is simulated and administered over the aspirants who came in for the program to see where are the competency gaps they have mm -hmm. and the strengths. And based on that gap is when we actually went ahead and did what we wanted to do mm -hmm. by uh, actually crafting the module for them. So um, we have also done so many like this for existing corporates because we have um, about 75 human test batteries and tools at IIHRM. And uh, where we see the capability competency levels that we see in corporate management today, and I also see the other side of the military, what they have, mm -hmm. and there is a lot of complementary skills that can be brought to corporates by the military people, mm -hmm. and also the gaps that the military people have, which M2C is now bridging. Right. So I think they, are, uh, they become more so like a perfect uh, uh, are I rather fit uh, compared to some of us who are in corporate without the military training and the exposure, mm -hmm. so but, to speak. Uh, but sorry to um, interrupt, but yeah. we, we see we have we have some amazing uh, corporates in Sri Lanka who have on their own developed, who have uh, who make uh, uh, good revenue, productivity, yes. and who take care of uh, their employees as well. But yes. what is what is the difference that the corporate will add? Um, military uh, personnel will add. Do we really need the military to join these corporates to um, to uh, bridge that gap? Okay. Um, yes. Why not? See, um, if you look at a corporate, um, uh, I'd like to ask uh, any CEO who's watching this program today, uh, do you have um, some problems in getting people uh, move from uh, uh, Sri Lanka to Japan tomorrow? Um, or from Colombo to Jaffna tomorrow? Um, overnight, for example, for a business reason. 
could be permanent placement or something. We need to talk to these people at least a couple of days hence and then keep talking to them, right? Do we have issues in getting people on time? I sometimes go on consultancy assignments and then about half an hour prior to see how people come for work. Whether they come uh, in a slowly, but at 4.30 they just shoot back to catch the train or the van or the bus. Um, that tells a lot about whether people wanting to come to work or need to come to work, two different things. But in my view, a military officer will be in their DNA wanting to come to work, okay? Which we don't need to struggle too much in investing in time and energy and various other things to get that piece done. It's a given. There can also be situations where people sometimes um, need to be convinced and there's a lot of me factor in most of the corporate personnel. Mm -hmm. Where we see, what is in it for me for me to go to Jaffna tomorrow? Okay, but uh, a military person, if we ask them to go, uh, who's in corporate now, okay, you go, uh, you need to take up this assignment in Jaffna tomorrow, he will just ask what time should I report, then there won't be any other questions, more in most cases, in my experience, mm -hmm. that, that really need to be negotiated. Mm -hmm. And uh, everything else is secondary, so it's not me first. So um, there are so many things. I'd like to explore, talk. explore yeah. this concept and talk more. But before that, let's take a short break here at Hyde Park. <music> Welcome back. Uh, General Ratnayaka, I think uh, Mr. Kulatunga was talking about uh, the me factor, me first, how the military uh, approaches situations but again uh, when we talk about corporates do we really need that regimented situation that that culture uh, or are you trying to do something different by uh, training the military here in order to incorporate the military culture uh, into corporates uh, <coughs> one can take it any way they like and but mm -hmm. what is um, we are trying to fit uh, in so the, the gaps the discipline here in the country today, in total uh, problem, mm -hmm. discipline. As he was saying, the uh, minor things like uh, time, uh, punctuality and various things. But more than that, military officers, when they are given a task, they, they focus, it, uh, focus on it and completely. When uh, in, in time, trying to now say, when COVID situation came up, so many people were panicking. I have seen and I, I am in the task force and all the corporate people, they were panicking, they couldn't cope that up. But um, we military officers got involved and settled them. So it's with, a, with a very small uh, input, the military officer can solve those things. So that's his, uh, the way he, he is being um, grown and trained, equipped. So these are the uh, advantages that uh, people have. When in trying conditions, when difficult situations, when the corporate face, in <coughs> whether it is due to a man-made problem or any other natural issue. So military officers have been trained and equipped to uh, settle those things in uh, <coughs> time of conflicts. These are the advantage. Other thing, the strategy. And most of the companies today are very competitive with their businesses. Uh, so <coughs> when there is a co huge competition come up, so the military officers always, they, they look at things and uh, kind of uh, um, strategizing things, transformation from ad hoc to a strategy. They're quite capable of doing things. So <coughs> they won't get uh, excited in a situation mm -hmm. like that. They won't get panic in a situation like that. So even for planning, prepara preparing things, cooperating things, organizing things, they are masters. They, they, they do it. Only thing they got to <coughs> get into the corporate and understand the corporate culture and see how fi they fit in. Not bringing military uh, culture into a corporate, but rather than saying so, they bring in some discipline, culture into an organization. So military has a lot of things. And what is happening in a corporate world, it is in the same form we have. The most of the fundamentals of management is so the same. But here in military, they do things <coughs> in a very serious, uh, complex uh, environments. So <coughs> when they get into a, 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 a corporate, so when <coughs> the corporates uh, are fighting in this uh, fighting in this competition, the competitive environment, 
so they can easily fit in if we if we really uh, bridge the gaps as uh, ranji was said mm -hmm. so we identify their <coughs> areas and what is the requirements of the corporate world and the capability capacity of the if there are any gaps we in, in, uh, identify and bridge those gaps and send them home mm -hmm. so they basically they do better than the average corporate people in any field uh, they uh, are employed. That is uh, how we think and that is how we have seen uh, uh, things. So that discipline, ready to work, <coughs> as you said, the me factor and all these things is basically in, with the military people, they are not there. It is in general terms, right. they take it as <coughs> our thing, the country first, organization first and all rest is secondary like that. That's how they are being groomed. This mm -hmm. culture in this, uh, the inbuilt thing in, in them. So these are the most valuable things. Only thing you have to tell them the techniques of the field, the <coughs> what is required to that special uh, group or company. The only thing that one should tell that the fundamental other things, it is there in him. Mm -hmm. If you quantify, say, if there are 10 requirements in the corporate world, uh, prerequisites, so maybe eight uh, already in highest form these officers will have, the military officers will have. So the only thing about two uh, you have to fill. So the once that is filled, they will be uh, much better people, uh, resourceful for, for, for people to the corporate world. How, how does this program work, Mr. Kulothanga? Um, what specific skills do you uh, train uh, the former military uh, personal military uh, war veterans uh, or those who are retiring from military work? Um, is there a tailor-made program or do you have uh, specific courses that they can follow? Okay, um, actually our approach here is uh, uh, more of a customized capsule mm -hmm. for the, the program that we just concluded for the retired uh, generals mm -hmm. and admirals um, and their vice marshals. What we did was uh, based on their uh, assessment that mm -hmm. we did, uh, the gaps we took based on a generic managerial leadership centric competency metrics that have been used corporate, by corporates globally and locally. We actually matched uh, those competency sets and then we actually uh, got them assessed mm -hmm. and we customized it. For example, he was talking about, General Dyer was talking about uh, uh, strategy. Mm -hmm. They're actually execution strategies. When it comes to growth strategy, they need help incorporate. So that was one capsule, for example. When it comes to uh, uh, securing profits, okay, um, like uh, analytics to various aspects of financials mm -hmm. to, uh, as to how do you really understand markets to do different types of research mechanisms to, you know, stuff like that. They had field work to go to uh, get done, mm -hmm. okay, to uh, really see how these things work. Um, so there are uh, quite a few things that they have not got their hands dirty, fingers dirty, so uh, been captured and sent them out to ensure that they actually gain the scale that they need. So um, to answer your question, it is uh, a general, a generic uh, compete management leadership capsule at a higher level mm -hmm. that we pitched, and that's the model we took in terms of competency battery, and then we assess these people against those competencies. Right. And then the gaps were customized further and it will be different slightly maybe for the next program depending on the, uh, the serving officers uh, that we intend to do on the 24th of this month, uh, the next capsule. So that might change a little bit also. So I understand uh, four batches have already been trained or is it three? Uh, no, we've, uh, we plan to do four. Uh -huh. We finished uh, one uh, capsule for the retired that's already done and dusted. Right. And then we do have uh, another one coming for the retired uh, officers soon after the one that is starting mm -hmm. on the 24th. Mm -hmm. So three more to go and one we've already concluded. Right. We, uh, as it was mentioned in the program earlier too, we've seen the military come forward in difficult situations of the country, whether it's the collapse of the um, a garbage dump or whether it is a COVID situation. Right. Uh, this is right. This is after fighting a brutal war here in Sri Lanka. But um, as we talk about this transition, um, do, you, do you think the, the military personnel you're training um, will, will be able to make the transition to a civilian role as we call a corporate culture? Okay, um, I, I, I will, as an organization development person, mm -hmm. I would look at it like this. I need 
some people and talent to grow volume share profit for my business. Okay, mm. so I have a manpower supply chain mm. out there, about 7.5 million people in our country right now as productive workforce. Okay, so I have to pick from this uh, resource. Now, take a person like me who's been trained uh, for corporate. Mm. And take a person who's been trained for corporate and who's been trained in the military in terms of comparability, uh, in terms of a skill and an experience uh, with different varied uh, situations depending on from job to job. Mm -hmm. um, I would actually take in, uh, when these people come in for the standard assessment, there can be a probability that a person who is trained in both worlds do well in terms of uh, a competency skill set. Mm -hmm. uh, technicalities will be the other thing that will actually vary, like the technical competency of a finance person, for an HR person, or marketing person, likewise. So um, that type of a thing will uh, make a distinction between a person who is trained as a marketer or something like that. But if you take the managerial competency part, uh, I think a person in the market vis-a-vis -vis somebody who is in the market, who's had a stint with a military, mm -hmm. can be more exposed, is what I feel. Right. But subjective uh, statement, subject to uh, the assessments that the organization would actually do and validate and take. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't actually box military to cooperate resource vis-a-vis -vis others. No, I would take everybody together, like anybody who's actually retired at 55 from any business, we be wanting to work because they can. Similarly, a person who is from the military will want to come, and mm -hmm. they can. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's just that the perception prevails that maybe, as you just asked, that they may or may not actually be the right fit. Maybe, but that's the one that we want to mitigate because it is our obligation and the nation's responsibility to ensure that they are employed, uh, but the employability and that sustenance actually, uh, if we can help, why not? Uh, we, on that note, we'll take a short break here at Hyde Park to stay with us. A warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park and we're talking about how we can use the military resource to enable the productivity uh, aspects as well as uh, performance revenue uh, development of corporates in Sri Lanka. Um, I'd like to start off with uh, Mr. Kulathunga. Um, has, has this uh, concept uh, or similar concepts been utilized elsewhere in the world? You come from a uh, human resources background and you're renowned uh, for your HR practices and success. So uh, what are the success stories you can share with us? Okay. Um, if you take the US, mm -hmm. okay, they do have uh, a M2C uh, fairly uh, established process which actually even helps all these uh, veterans with uh, reskilling in different areas that they would wish to go in for mm -hmm. as, a, as a second career. Mm -hmm. um, and then also if you take, don't go far, even Pakistan, they have uh, a hugely, uh, you know, like a mega support mechanism of an M2C. Okay. Um, and then uh, they in fact even uh, go and uh, uh, merge with different corporates uh, to ensure that the employability is uh, right. you know, supported and things like that happens. For example, Johnson & Johnson, I know um, their manpower supply chain is uh, a certain percentage is allocated for the war veterans. Um, in Sri Lanka, there are quite a few companies who are actually looking for uh, certain military people mm -hmm. uh, by choice. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's happening in even in here. And uh, if the if we had this session, let's say about uh, eight six weeks ago, I would uh, basically ask for help. Okay, from the corporates uh, to look at the uh, the graduates of the M2C. But Does I wouldn't this mean today. you have enough support now that there is a lot of interest from corporates? Uh, we do have, uh, General Daya can actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, talk more on that one. Right. We've had about eight uh, top corporate uh, uh, business leaders coming and talking to them and they actually saw the metal of these people. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a huge demand as is, you know, as we speak. So 
I think uh, with the Ceylon Chamber coming forward to uh, be our partner to uh, as the post-graduation placement partner. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think uh, there is a lot of hope that people can have and uh, corporates who are very interested can even uh, come in and register uh, for potential exposure right. through the chamber. I, I don't know how the program works uh, in the sense uh, practically how it runs but uh, what I'm trying to understand is whether you have space for corporate leaders or CEOs of company uh, to join this program so that they can also understand uh, how uh, knowledge sharing and skills development and training happens. Yes, uh, in fact uh, right now what has happened in the previous program was uh, we invited uh, for the eight days, we invited eight corporate leaders to come in and very willingly they came in. Okay. Uh, the, the, some of the very best corporates right. came in, uh, the chairman and CEOs of those companies. So us answering your question, for sure, uh, people who are interested to come and volunteer, uh, because we have a slot for a keynote every day. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, for uh, 30, 45 minutes to share their wisdom, and also to spell out as to what they really look forward in these people when they come in, you know, which helps both parts. Mm -hmm. General Dayarat Nayaka, um, we're talking about training um, military veterans. Um, I, I think all this time you mentioned about uh, the senior capacity uh, at, the, at the top tier, generals, for retired generals or those who are retiring. What happens at the uh, lower level or below officer level? Uh, are you all also planning to incorporate them, uh, bring them into this corporate structure? Yeah, indeed. upon retirement. Yes, of course. Uh, actually, um, this uh, we started uh, at this level. At those who are retiring after 55 years, and we, there are people who are retiring even earlier. Mm -hmm. And after 20 years of service, anybody can in the military can go on full retirement. So this, this oh, are at the age of 55, is it? Age of 55, the officer uh -huh. Then the soldiers go after 22 mm -hmm. years of service. Ma it's mandatory. So there are a large number of soldiers who are capable and, and junior level, managerial level people who are in the civil society. I told you at the beginning, there are 20,000 left out uh, between 2016 uh, to 2020. Uh, 40,000 from the army alone left uh, after 22 years of service. It's a this is after the war. After the war. So these are quite experienced veterans. So, and if we had a nice program, we would have fit them into uh, uh, gaps in the uh, civil society for the better um, and of the corporate world and other uh, private sector and government sector. So <coughs> um, our, our objective is, uh, we started this one at this moment. Now we are discussing with the commanders. They are very keen and the secretary and all the people at the top level in the militaries, they, they, they are quite keen. We want to get this down to the junior officers. Actually, our thinking now is mm -hmm. not being implemented, finalized, but our thinking is to get uh, them at the junior level. Junior, level, say captain level, give them a program like this and get them uh, into the corporate to work, uh, say at least go on uh, uh, some arrangements to work uh, well, six months or one year in the corporate sector, come back and work in the military again mm -hmm. and then get him back at uh, probably a mid level, say major or a colonel level, then as a brigadier before they leave and two, three uh, uh, instances they go and work, uh, interact with the civil sector, the corporate world. So this is, and the corporate people also do, there are so many courses run by the military, especially for military. Even now at uh, certain courses like in National Defense University course, and also the Staff College course, we get outside civilian people to come and go through those programs. It's a very good, in a country like, smaller country like ours, uh, it's uh, very good because military is a huge resource and people are saying militarization is not the right word. These are all Western thinking. Here in a country like ours, this is a huge resource. The large number of people live in the army. And these are disciplined, as I told you earlier, uh, very good people. So they can be fit into the civil sector. And like uh, smaller countries like Singapore, Israel, Taiwan, you see all the top people in society and the corporate world, the government sector, they come from the military. And any other, uh, <coughs> even developed countries and s people in the civil street, uh, um, in the civil sector, they come from uh, military background. There are countries, they have essential military service, like in US and Germany and other countries. So they all top people, scientists, and all the people come from uh, the corporate leaders, entrepreneurs, all from mm -hmm. uh, majority or from the, um, with a military background. 
So it is good actually because in a country where we have had so many issues, so many problems we have faced in 30 years of war and two times southern insurgency and COVID situation, so many volatile, uh, volatile situations we have faced. So <coughs> when these kind of situations to stabilize a country, um, to, uh, I, I always feel uh, military officers can play a key role in the sector, civil sector. So that is where, and so uh, the people have different perspective. In, so we, we people with vested interest will criticize this. No, it is for a country like ours. This is a huge resource that we are just uh, forgetting. Right. Uh, yes, as I said, military resource, but the employability of this resource. Very quickly before we go in for a break, uh, Mr. Kulatunga. Um, how, how do you look at that? What is, what is the interest from corporates? You did mention that eight corporates have been uh, highly interested, uh, but uh, for, a, for a CEO or corporate leader who's watching right now, um, how could they reach out and what is the level of employability for uh, veterans? Okay, uh, I think um, coming down to um, the lower ranks, the lower levels of people, it needs to be a targeted skill specific mm -hmm. training is mandatory. Mm -hmm. For example, um, uh, having worked in the telco industry with uh, dialogue, I know this uh, thing of um, uh, riggers who goes up those uh, towers. Uh, if you take sub service providers for those, I think uh, uh, they are hugely limited, for example. So uh, skilling people to do something like that and creating that resource and putting them out. Similarly, in the, uh, in the hotel industry, as it starts to boom, uh, we have military runs different hotels. Those can be ideal training grounds as well for them to actually go back and they'll be disciplined. Mm -hmm. And they will also be, uh, you know, uh, be very capable and then uh, uh, be able to really serve these people well, the guests, in a different uh, perspective. And they will always be there on time. Mm -hmm. And all these type of things will uh, are really um, painful things for uh, the hotel sector, for example. Right. Similarly, it can be in any sector that you want to really look at. You can actually skill them that way, is uh, how we see it. And based on the appetite of the corporates, where we need. Because uh, I think the manpower histogram of the central bank, when we looked at it some time ago, about two years ago, uh, about 7.5 million uh, population that we have which is productive, we come down to about 1.3 million, I think, around 2026, 20, 2027, mm -hmm. okay? So we'll definitely need people to uh, be working for uh, our corporates. And there will be people who will come from other countries for sure, but it depends on how much uh, corporates are willing to pay and what other offers are being given by other countries. Right. So uh, this is a very important uh, thing that we shouldn't forget. Mm -hmm. I'll see you again on the other side of this break. Do stay with us. Mm. Welcome back. Uh, General Ratnayak, um, I think we have, I'm sure, most of our veterans, uh, retired uh, military personnel, are watching the show tonight. Um, and uh, probably they're also interested in finding out how they can join this program, the skills training program. Uh, and if there is opportunity for them also to be a part of this program, because we're talking about at the age of 55, you're retiring. This is a massive, vast experience that uh, will not be utilized for any benefit. But of course, in the recent times after the war, we've seen how the military came forward, as I said before, to help and uh, support the country in massive endeavors, various endeavors. Um, in this scenario, how will you uh, talk to and reach out to uh, veterans? This is not just to the Army, this is to the Navy and uh, the Air Force as well. Yeah, actually, Indri, thank you for asking this question. <coughs> because uh, we have large number of officers left and they are staying at homes. Uh, that's uh, not right. And we, this is a program, this kind of a pilot program, we are doing it and definitely we are going down and get all the officers who are not properly employed, gainfully employed, to go through a program like this and we will uh, get them into so civil society. And not only uh, the corporate world, but there are so many other avenues people uh, have. And um, uh, Mr. Ashtroff came in and gave us a superb suggestion. We create a fund 
and um, uh, uh, give these people to start their own businesses, SMEs, small industries, to start uh, to, uh, for them to start. And there are a lot of opportunities we are going to create for these people. So um, we and those who are uh, <coughs> actually not having a proper employment, definitely our objective is to get them and go through these programs and get them into this market. Not only for the local market, but also the, the we have created a nice uh, website. We have created that, um, and there we promote these people for headhunters around the world to find um, our people to have opportunities in those. So this is also one objective. And um, so we will not leave them out, and the government also taking it very seriously to look into these people, because these are, as everyone says, and throughout the program we said, these are disciplined and nice people who always think of the country uh, rather than uh, thinking of their own uh, self. So <coughs> uh, they will, uh, for them, we will get, and for you, them also, those who are watching, uh, military, ex-military officers, and you also must understand your capacity, capability. Some much you have not understood, and you have a superb capacity. Because I have the experience. I have worked with multinational companies for the last five years, and I also was uh, going there uh, without uh, right confidence. But when I sat there in the boards, I realized, my God, <laughs> uh, this is uh, easy. And I was so um, helpful to many fields, not only the security, not only the human resource, not only other people, all aspects. We could put in a lot of um, new inputs into those uh, areas. So that is how the military officer is, right? If he given a chance, he prosper. That's how it is. So you have the chance. We will create this chance. Governments also are very keen in doing that and cooperate also very clean. There are some sponsors I must mention, if you permit me to mention this, all programs sponsored by Mr. Sumal Pereira. He came out and the, he was the first person we spoke to and he came and uh, sponsored uh, these programs. They're a little costly, these programs, to run, get 25 officers at given time, give them top class facilities and without them spending a cent, we are spending for uh, these programs, uh, quite expensive uh, from our point of view. So, but they are sponsoring it, and I am grateful to, and so many other corporate leaders who came and supported us. They, are, <coughs> they promised to recruit some of the officers, uh, and that's also very. We are very grateful. So there is a huge awareness now coming up. In the, this is only the beginning. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, within next two three months, when we have programs, and this program also will open up to the other uh, areas also. So I hope this will be a, a kind of a turning point in this field. Certainly, we have had uh, many uh, veterans, um, those who have dedicated their life to uh, the sovereignty, security, and uh, of uh, civilian life. And after their retirement, um, their skills, their talents are left unused or are not uh, used for any productivity in the country. But I think this program, a question may arise whether this is free of charge or whether there is a cost for the military officers. Uh, this is an amazing program put together, but um, uh, if you're unable to provide for the program, how can they, or is this free of charge? Um, right now, as General Ratnayaka said, mm -hmm. um, there are uh, access uh, engineering PLC um, the Led chairman Sumar yeah, Perera. Sumar Perera, is actually uh, uh, coming in as our resource partner mm -hmm. uh, who's facilitating the, uh, the uh, cost part of it. Mm -hmm. So um, for this program, uh, therefore, it is a s more of a scholarship for them. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I'm very grateful uh, and happy. Um, I think my uh, co-author, uh, Dr. Dinesh uh, Vatavana, will join me. Um, particularly, uh, there are generals who have come and gone. Uh, and then here, uh, for, for General Ratnayak to bring this concept to life, mm -hmm. and also uh, the serving generals, the CDS, the Chief of Defense Staff, and the other commanders who actually came forward to support this in person, mm -hmm. and particularly for someone who's actually retired and gone. In corporates as well, we have people whom we look after when they're there, after they're gone. Uh, very seldom that one would actually look at them uh, and there are a few companies who would actually lay claim. So I think it's a great uh, initiative and a good example for even a state from the state sector uh, coming uh, out to really care for those people who have actually retired mm -hmm. and then to help them continue 
their right. livelihoods. Uh, before we wrap up, I think I want to turn to General Atnayaka again. As we mentioned at the beginning of the program, you're one military person, a veteran, uh, who has um, been gainfully employed um, at international level and now in uh, the state sector too. Um, it's not easy as we talk about the Ports Authority also because through history we talk about uh, union uh, disruption. How are you managing that? <laughs> Indeed, I am enjoying it. Very <laughs> well. it's, um, military officers enjoy when there are a lot of challenges, when there are a lot of, uh, as I told, the problems, when situations, when change in situations, when volatile situations. We enjoy and we, <laughs> we have been trained uh, to face such situations and enjoy such situations. Actually, Port Authority is a nice place for me. It's a huge resource and 99.7% of import export take place. It's a very important organization in the country and 24-7 you have to work, you can't close. There are so many uh, things happening there. There's a lot of things uh, revolves around that. So when you are managing it and my training, my uh, military culture, military discipline help a lot there because a lot of people think uh, bringing in militarization. People don't understand what this militarization is. It's just completely a different thing. It is not. We never bring in. Once we retire, and I be, I'm a normal person. I'm a people. And if people are saying that military, military people cannot work anywhere, I mean, it is a discarded lot. You think? No. These are huge, disciplined, resourceful people. Uh, we must gainfully employ them. Only thing, when I got this opportunity in managing the port, uh, I took some time, it took me some time for me to uh, understand the uh, culture there. But what I, un I understand, I think I'm enjoying it very well. So, so many challenges came, all those challenges we uh, did overcome and got the people. And so we use our all uh, <coughs> experience and um, I'm enjoying it. You say uh, ex-military, but I'm a normal person. I think we've seen in the US also as we speak, um, uh, the, uh, veterans being gainfully employed. But here in Sri Lanka, this concept of uh, militarization, as you say, and we see the, this, this, um, uh, this idea of being heavily propagated that uh, the military is taking over. Um, whether, whether we respond to that or not, uh, the state sector, we are talking about uh, driving revenue, loss making entities, can't the military be a part of uh, uh, the revival of SOEs? Of course, if you're asking me that question, definitely. If any organization given to us, we know how to do it and turn it around. Uh, so we always get situations uh, beyond the capacity capability. We face situations uh, where it is beyond the capacity capability of average human, so normal people. That is how we get jobs. So that is how we are trained, structured and equipped to take on jobs beyond the capacity capability of average civilians, average people. So I mean, if uh, in situations like this, uh, <coughs> yeah, our officers are always have done much better, uh, better because no, not that other people are incapable, but uh, given a huge uh, volatile situation, um, so the, uh, the our people, military people, are quite better because that is how they are. I mean, for that only they are being groomed. So that is why I say in country like ours, we need more people, uh, and uh, the people also must understand. Uh, how uh, it sh they should be employed properly and how they should be supported to uh, get these organizations. I'm sure, uh, to answer your question, if opportunities are given, definitely they will bring up to that standard and definitely they are not going to sustain. They will give it to the p right people and they will quietly uh, go away once the no situations charity. become no. This is no charity. I think yes, uh, this, is, this is the utilization of oh, one of yes. Sri Lanka's best resources yes, to the benefit of our uh, corporates. So, yes. and uh, in the very military has always been given jobs beyond the capacity. COVID situation when other people aren't co capable, it was given to the military. The war is also signed like that. If there is any disaster, who is being employed? And when it is beyond the capacity of every civilian or organizations, it is given to the military. That is how. So in situations like in Sri Lanka today, is right more people getting in and uh, I think uh, it is better for the best interest of the country that is my thinking. Thank you very much for this program. Thank you very much for coming over to our studios. I was quite interested when I heard about this program, which is why I uh, reached out to uh, request a discussion of this nature uh, to talk a little more about uh, the support uh, the corporates will have 
through the recruitment and employment of uh, uh, ex-military in Sri Lanka. We talk about uh, the bravery, we talk about the selflessness of our military, but at the prime of uh, their careers and age, they retire. And here is an opportunity to gainfully employ uh, our former military veterans. Uh, thank you very much, I think, for this discussion. This is all the time we have. Uh, General Dayarat Naika, our 20th Army Commander and the Chairman of Sri Lanka Ports Authority, as well as Mr. Ranjiva Kulatunga, a renowned international HR professional who's now uh, the co-author of the M2C Military to Corporate Framework in Sri Lanka. Thank you very much. And that's all this week at Hyde Park.